the third temple, described in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, is the gathering place of the elect from the four winds, the place of the second coming of Jesus Christ, the place of the rapture of the church. Messengers of Yeshua from among all nations must enter the eastern gate of the temple, and the moment the eastern gate is closed on Yom Kippur will become that, twinkling of an eye, when the status of the people who entered this gate will change. They will become the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Understanding this is enough for everyone to bury their noses in the Holy Scriptures, in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, wanting to understand what is about to happen to all of us. The third temple is important not only for Jews, but also for Christians, because it is Christians who should passionately desire the second coming of Christ and the resurrection of the first. We only need to read one verse from the book of the prophet Ezekiel to understand that the temple shown to Ezekiel should not be built in Jerusalem, but in a completely different place. In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel, and set me up on a very high mountain, by which was as the frame of a city on the south. This verse says three times that the temple should not be built in Jerusalem. Firstly, there are no mountains in Jerusalem, there are hills. Moreover, there is no very high mountain in Jerusalem. Secondly, the previous temples stood on the eastern slope, and not on the southern one. Third, Ezekiel did not recognize the place shown to him. The prophecy of Ezekiel indicates the area of the territory that should be set aside for the Lord and enclosed with a wall. The size of the Lord God's estate is 1,440 by 1,440 meters, and there should be an area 24 meters wide outside the perimeter wall. That is, an area of one and a half by one and a half kilometers, almost a square mile, must be cleared of any buildings or graves. This cannot be done in Jerusalem. And even if all the buildings and all the graves were demolished, this would not help the fulfillment of the prophecy, because in the conditions of Jerusalem, a stream of water would not flow from under the threshold of the temple, there is no underground water for this. And even if people built a pipeline under the temple so that water would flow from there, it would not be able to get to Nahal Aragat to reach Ein Gedi, as described in Ezekiel. That is, waiting for the construction of the third temple in Jerusalem is in vain, and we must deal with the prophecy of Ezekiel in order to find the place that God has designated for the temple. It turns out that if you measure the holy allotment according to the dimensions specified in the prophecy of Ezekiel, then this allotment can only be located in one specific place in Israel. The oblation that ye shall offer unto the Lord shall be of five and twenty thousand in length, and of ten thousand in breadth. The measurements were taken with a measuring reed, the length of the reed was six cubits, that is, two meters eighty-eight centimeters, about nine and a half feet. And for them, even for the priests, shall be this holy oblation, toward the north five and twenty thousand in length, and toward the west ten thousand in breadth, and toward the east ten thousand in breadth, and toward the south five and twenty thousand in length, and the sanctuary of the Lord shall be in the midst thereof. It is important here that we do not make a mistake with the direction in which to measure the sides of the rectangle of the sacred site. Since it is written, to the north, this means the direction of movement in the measurement process, and not at all the northern side of the sacred site. If Ezekiel had pointed to the north side, it would have been written, in the north, or, from the north. All previous interpreters of Ezekiel's prophecy made this mistake, they drew the long side of this site from the north. Therefore, they were unable to find the location of the temple shown to Ezekiel. It shall be for the priests that are sanctified of the sons of Zadok, which have kept my charge, which went not astray when the children of Israel went astray, as the Levites went astray. The priests are Kohanim, direct descendants of Aaron. The fact that Ezekiel calls them sons of Zadok means that they are sons of justice or sons of righteousness. This indicates a spiritual continuity of their ministry, and not just inheritance through earthly genealogy. 
and this oblation of the land that is offered shall be unto them a thing most holy by the border of the Levites. And over against the border of the priests the Levites shall have five and twenty thousand in length, and ten thousand in breadth. All the length shall be five and twenty thousand, and the breadth ten thousand. And they shall not sell of it, neither exchange, nor alienate the firstfruits of the land, for it is holy unto the Lord. These two land allotments, the Kohanim allotment and the Levitical allotment, together make up the tribe of Levi. The simple rectangular shape of this allotment of the tribe of Levi allows us to calculate the area of this ancestral allotment. The area of the tribe of Levi is 4,151 square kilometers. This is a very important quantity. The plots of all the tribes of Israel must be equal in size. Therefore, the area of the allotment of each tribe of Israel is equal to the area of the allotment of the tribe of Levi, equal to 4,151 square kilometers. And the 5,000 that are left in the breadth over against the 5 and 20,000 shall be a profane place for the city, for dwelling, and for suburbs, and the city shall be in the midst thereof. And these shall be the measures thereof, the north side four thousand and five hundred, and the south side four thousand and five hundred, and on the east side four thousand and five hundred, and the west side four thousand and five hundred. The city measures about thirteen kilometers, or about eight miles. And the suburbs of the city shall be toward the north two hundred and fifty, and toward the south two hundred and fifty, and toward the east two hundred and fifty, and toward the west two hundred and fifty. Here we are not talking about the suburbs used for settlement, but about fields with access roads to the gates of the city. The populated suburbs are the rest of the territory located to the north and south of the city. And the residue in length over against the oblation of the holy portion shall be ten thousand eastward and ten thousand westward. And it shall be over against the oblation of the holy portion, and the increase thereof shall be for food unto them that serve the city. Ordinary cities in this world do not set aside territory for their own food needs, they buy and import food from everywhere. The fact that the city of Yahweh Shammah will have special agricultural land for its needs indicates that this city will not use money. There will be no money in this city, there will be no buying and selling. And this city will be self-sufficient, the city will not depend on outside donations. And they that serve the city shall serve it out of all the tribes of Israel. It will be a city only for Jews. Gentiles will not be allowed into the city of Yahweh Shammah. Just as Gentiles will not be allowed into heavenly Jerusalem, on the gates of which are written the names of the tribes of Israel, for which entry is open there. All the oblation shall be five and twenty thousand by five and twenty thousand. Ye shall offer the holy oblation four square with the possession of the city. The western area, used to provide food for the city, should be included in the holy allotment. And the residue shall be for the prince, and on the one side and on the other of the holy oblation, and of the possession of the city over against the five and twenty thousand of the oblation toward the east border, and westward over against the five and twenty thousand toward the west border, over against the portions for the prince. And it shall be the holy oblation, and the sanctuary of the house shall be in the midst thereof. Moreover from the possession of the Levites, and from the possession of the city, being in the midst of that which is the princes, between the border of Judah and the border of Benjamin, shall be for the prince. If you superimpose the measured rectangle of the holy allotment on the territory of Israel, you will find that there is only one way it can be placed there. If you move the holy allotment a little further north, it will not fit into the gap between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan. If you move the holy allotment a little to the south, then the historical part of Jerusalem will be outside its borders. The Mediterranean Sea does not allow moving the holy allotment to the west, 
and the Jordan and the Dead Sea do not allow moving the holy allotment to the east. The fact that part of the territory to the west of the city ends up in the Mediterranean Sea does not matter, this area should be used for the food needs of the city, and there may be an exclusive fishing zone there. When we accurately located the holy allotment within the borders of Israel, then in the very center of the sacred site given to the Kohanim, we found the mountain on which the prophet Ezekiel stood in his vision. On the southern slope of this mountain a scattering of stones was discovered, which we identify as the ruins of the altar built by Abraham. This altar is known as Jehovah Jireh. The altar of the third temple was to be built on this site. This is truly a very deserted place, far from any settlement. God sent Abraham to the desert for sacrifice, he could not try to arrange a human sacrifice near an ancient settlement on the site of present-day Jerusalem, in full view of people. And Abraham could not manage to walk from Beersheba to Jerusalem in two days. Moreover, with Abraham there was a donkey loaded with firewood, which could not be forced to go more than its daily quota. About 100 kilometers to Jerusalem, and a donkey will not cover more than 40 kilometers in a day. We also need to remember that Abraham had to build an altar out of stones, and the stones on the mountainside had to be lifted from below, from the bed of the stream. This is long and hard work that could take half a day. Mount Moriah is not the land of Moriah at all. King David stubbornly called the site of the future altar shown to him as the threshing floor of Orna the Jebusite. Who is Orna the Jebusite to mention if King David knew that this is the same land of Moriah mentioned in the Torah? King David never called the site of the future temple, the land of Moriah, the legend appeared centuries later. Now, thanks to the prophecy of Ezekiel, we have found the real land of Moriah, and we have discovered the ruins of the altar of Jehovah Jireh. And on the slopes of these mountains, if you look closely, you can see a natural inscription made by stream beds. It is written in Hebrew, Yad Shin Vav Ayin, that is, Yeshua. All signs of the found place coincide with the details indicated in the prophecy of Ezekiel. Now let's compare the scheme of the holy allotment with what is written in the 45th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. Moreover, when ye shall divide by a lot the land for inheritance, ye shall offer an oblation unto the Lord, an holy portion of the land. The length shall be the length of five and twenty thousand reeds, and the breadth shall be ten thousand. This shall be holy in all the borders thereof round about. On this there shall be for the sanctuary five hundred in length, with five hundred in breadth, square round about. And fifty cubits round about for the suburbs thereof. Here we are not talking about residential suburbs, but about a shopping area along the perimeter of the outer wall around the estate of the Lord God. The width of this shopping area is 50 cubits, which is equal to 24 meters. On this square they will sell sacrificial animals, as well as other products, wine, vodka, for the festive feast in the house of the Lord. And of this measure shalt thou measure the length of five and twenty thousand, and the breadth of ten thousand, and it shall be the sanctuary and the most holy place. The holy portion of the land shall be for the priests, the ministers of the sanctuary, which shall come near to minister unto the Lord. And it shall be a place for their houses, and an holy place for the sanctuary. And the five and twenty thousand of length, and the ten thousand of breadth, shall also the Levites, the ministers of the house, have for themselves, for a possession, for twenty chambers. This is mistranslated. Twenty means twenty thousand canes. Of the total length of twenty-five thousand reeds of the Levites' allotment, only twenty thousand reeds of length will be allocated for their residence. Ten thousand reeds of length will be allocated for the dwellings of the Levites to the north of the territory intended for the food needs of the city, and another 10,000 will be allocated to the south. 10 plus 10, a total of 20,000 reeds in length, will be intended for the settlements of the Levites. And the five and twenty thousand of length, and the ten thousand of breadth, 
shall also the Levites, the ministers of the house, have for themselves, for a possession, twenty thousand for chambers. For a possession, twenty thousand for chambers. And ye shall appoint the possession of the city, five thousand broad, and five and twenty thousand long, over against the oblation of the holy portion. It shall be for the whole house of Israel. And a portion shall be for the prince on the one side, and on the other side of the oblation of the holy portion, and of the possession of the city, before the oblation of the holy portion, and before the possession of the city, from the west side westward, and from the east side eastward. And the length shall be over against one of the portions, from the west border unto the east border. This verse confirms that we have correctly positioned the sides of the rectangle of the holy oblation. If, to the north, in the tenth verse of the forty-eighth chapter meant the north side, then the location of all the allotments would have to be rotated ninety degrees. Then this verse would become incomprehensible, where the prince's possessions are located on the east, near the holy oblation with the temple, and on the west, near the possessions of the city. With the location of the estates rotated 90 degrees within the boundaries of the holy allotment, the prince's possessions would be equally located in relation to both the possessions of the Kohanim and the possessions of the city. In the land shall be his possession in Israel, and my princes shall no more oppress my people, and the rest of the land shall they give to the house of Israel according to their tribes. Thus saith the Lord God, let it suffice you, O princes of Israel, remove violence and spoil, and execute judgment and justice. Take away your exactions from my people, saith the Lord God. Having familiarized ourselves in more detail with the place where the temple will be built, we see on the topographic map a natural body of water a few hundred meters west of the temple. This body of water is located at a level higher than the place where the temple will be built. This indicates the presence of underground water horizons near the Earth's surface. The underground water horizons slope from the Hebron highlands towards the Dead Sea. During the construction of the foundation of the temple, underground waters will burst out from under the ground, which will provide the picture that Ezekiel saw, water flowed from under the threshold of the temple to the east. Afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under from the right side of the house, at the south side of the altar. The temple is located on the watershed of the basins of two main streams in the Judean desert, the Nahal Aragot stream and the Nahal Hever stream. The stream of water flowing from under the threshold of the temple will be directed to the watershed, not far from the northeastern corner of the temple complex. There this stream of water will be divided into two streams, one will flow into the Nahal Aragat stream, the other into the Nahal Hever stream. Therefore, the flow of water from under the temple will flow into both Nahal Aragat and Nahal Hever. This is exactly what Ezekiel prophesied. And it shall come to pass, that everything that liveth which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live, and there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live, whither the river cometh. There is an error in the translation here. Ezekiel says that there will be two streams. And it shall come to pass, that every thing that liveth which moveth, whithersoever the two rivers shall come, shall live, and there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and every thing shall live, whither the river cometh. The waters of one stream will flow into the Dead Sea near Ein Gedi. The waters of another stream will flow into the Dead Sea near Ein Aglaim. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from En Gedi, even unto En Eglaim. They shall be a place to spread forth nets, their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many.
Ein Gedi is translated from Hebrew as source of the kid, Ein Aglaim is translated as source of the two heifers. We see that at the mouth of the Nahal Aragat stream, which flows into the Dead Sea near Ein Gedi, the water enters the sea through a single bed. And the Nahal Hever stream at its mouth bifurcates into two streams. Thus we were able to find the location of the biblical place name Ein Aglaim, the location of which was previously unknown. We find additional confirmation of the correctness of our determined location of the temple when we read how Ezekiel in chapter 47 describes measurements of the length of the stream of water near the temple complex. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters, the waters were to the ankles. Again he measured a thousand, and brought me through the waters, the waters were to the knees. Again he measured a thousand, and brought me through, the waters were to the loins. Afterward he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. We see that an abrupt increase in the depth of the flow occurred each time in places where the channel connected with other flows. The matching of the measurements on the topographic map with the measurements described in Ezekiel's prophecy confirms that we have found the correct site for the third temple. So, we found the site of the temple. Now all we have to do is build this temple. The temple project has also already been created and published. You can read about it in the book, The Temple According to the Prophecy of Ezekiel, Project 1534, link below the video.